unsolved crimes newspaper as a response to Cavalier civil society organization within the framework of a struggle against religious extremism presents. Apologetica ed è arrivata una convocazione da parte del Papa. Massimo Intervenia, Italian religion sociologist, doctor of philosophy, professor, founder and managing director of the Center for Studies on New Religions, former representative on combating racism, xenophobia and discrimination at OSCE. Could you please help me with a certain, let me say, problem or a phenomena? You know, in the Russian orthodoxy there is such a phenomena that is called sect. Mm -hmm. But the problem is lying in the fact there is no concrete definition. Mm -hmm. Could you please uh, give just some words over this definition? What is the sect? What does this word and this phenomenon mean? Uh, there is a problem of uh, terminology because the, actually in English the bad word is cult and I think we should translate what is sect in French or secte in German or secta in Spanish as cult because the really bad word in English is cult so the movement against the cults we normally call in sociology the anti-cult movement in English mm -hmm. and anti-sect movement uh, in, uh, in French. So the bad word, if you want to say a group is bad, uh, normally you use a sect in uh, Spanish, German, French, Italian, you use cult in English. I But see. let's start with sect. Uh, sect is a word which was introduced uh, by the founders of the sociology of religion, like uh, Max Weber and Ernst Trölch. Uh, originally it was not a bad word, because it uh, simply meant uh, a, a recent group, a group where people were not born, because it was new, nobody would have been born, and everybody was converted, saying what is a sect? or a cult in English, it's a religious group where crimes are committed. Uh, and that created a big problem for sociologists to use the word sect just to uh, designate a recent religious group. So it was not a bad word. Thank you so much. Now I see the difference. But still the question is, What is the core component helping us to distinguish the difference between a real cult or not so good say sect or between the organization who is being claimed of being a cult? I think uh, uh, in a scientific sense uh, the only if we want to use uh, the word cult or sect and uh, normally in sociology we don't uh, uh -huh. but for criminologists uh, it's uh, the commission of major crimes and they would say common crimes common crimes the crimes are terrorism rape uh, violence uh, mm -hmm. against uh, children Uh, systematic uh, use of tax evasion or economic fraud. These are the real features uh, uh, of a cult or sect in the criminological sense. Now, I know uh, and I can elaborate on this because I was very much part of this debate back 20-30 years ago. Some psychologists, and here we have a third category, we have sociologists, we have criminologists, and we have psychologists. Some psychologists try to say that cults or sex use brainwashing or mind control, while legitimate religion do not use brainwashing or mind control. Mm -hmm. This is now an old thing, because uh, Uh, brainwashing has been so much criticized that even among psychologists and psychiatrists only a tiny minority still believes in the theory of... But let me elaborate mm -hmm. on controversy on brainwashing. 
Uh, brainwashing is a word which was invented by the CIA, the American Secret Service, uh, in order to attack uh, communists, uh, Russia and uh, China. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first use of the word brainwashing is by a certain Edward Hunter, uh, who was uh, posed as a journalist for a Miami uh, daily newspaper, but was really an agent of the OSS, which later became the CIA, and he claimed that in the communist countries uh, they had certain magical techniques to really wash the brain of the people, mm -hmm. and that was the only way of explaining how normal people can believe in such a strange thing as uh, communism. Thank you so much for your explanation, it's very clear, and right now I see the difference. Um, apart from everything, uh, I would like to know, as far as I'm concerned, you're a lawyer as well, right? Uh, uh, let's say yes, I'm no longer practicing, but uh, uh, I, I'm still a member of a law firm, mm -hmm. yes. As far as being a lawyer, could you please uh, give me a slightest explanation of whether there is some point of destructive cult? Destructive cults or harmful cults, uh, again, uh, we can use it in a legitimate uh, criminological sense. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, religious groups who commit serious crimes, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, we can also use it uh, in a polemical sense. Uh, and in this case, uh, uh, some people will still use uh, ray washing. Uh, uh, in Russia, I believe. It's a certain Alexander Dvorkin uh, who has this kind of theories, but they are regarded as very old theories. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody will take them uh, seriously in, uh, in Western universities. So, sometimes destructive cults or harmful cults is just a label. Just used a label, to... right. Mm -hmm. uh, dear Professor, could you please uh, explain the mechanism or maybe some sort of model or instrument Mm, explaining how people make money over handing out the labels of destructive cults, the sects, uh, maybe some people who make money over the flock. How do they do that? By manipulating the real beliefs and faith of the people. Well, I think the anti-cult movements also made some money by labeling other groups or sects or cults. Uh, they exploited the, the fear uh, because some uh, religious groups, uh, let's call them real cults in the criminological sense, uh, did something very bad. Of course. We had the mass suicide, uh, like in uh, Guyana, uh, uh, or the Solar Temple in Switzerland, France, and Canada. Uh, we had the terrorist attacks, like the Aung Shinrikyo group in the south way of uh, Tokyo. Uh, so we had real bad uh, uh, cults. And they exploit this fear, saying it's a big, big problem. And they don't it a bit. And uh, so uh, it became a sort of profession. Uh, and by managing the label of cults and sects, these movements uh, uh, received the money the government. Also, there was a strange phenomenon, mm -hmm. which is now almost ended. Uh, it was called the deprogramming, and deprogramming meant, uh, was based on the theory of brainwashing. Mm -hmm. If somebody has been brainwashed, uh, he needs to be cured of brainwashing. So some people call themselves uh, deprogrammers, they even made a movie about it with Harvey Keto. Mm -hmm. uh, People called the programmers uh, were hired by the parents of the members of the so-called cults mm -hmm. and kidnapped uh, these uh, members who were adults, major of age. They were kidnapped, they were held prisoners, uh, and the, the programmers tried to persuade them to leave the cult by bombarding them with. Uh, uh, bad information about the cults, sometimes beating them in a couple of cases. It was recognized it was a crime. Oh. In the United States, uh, uh, by the 1990s, the courts uh, had decided the programming was a crime. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, it took more. 
But uh, finally, in 1999, uh, the European Court of Human Rights, of which Russia is a part, yeah. uh, in a case involving Spain and the, the programming of members of an esoteric group, uh, also decided that the deprogramming is against the human rights and should not be condoned. So the programming survived in some countries such as Japan, but now even the Japanese courts in recent years decided it's illegal. So almost all over the world, the program is illegal. But now we know the programming was very expensive. The programmer charged 50,000, 100,000 euros for one uh, attempt at the program without guarantee of our results. And of course, uh, some of them are still around. They claim now they do exit counseling, which is without violence. But sometimes it's more or less the same. Steve Hassan, Rick Ross, uh, some of the old programmers uh, uh, are still around and try to survive in some countries. But in most countries, their business has been declared as illegal. Mm -hmm. So what, why do you think certain people try to persuade the others, like certain organizations that are not even connected with some sort of religion or personal belief? Why these organizations sometimes are being called the destructive cults, the crime cults, the crime criminal sects and so on and so forth? Well, it depends, because uh, uh, criminal cult or sect uh, or destructive cult is a very convenient label to attack uh, your uh, opponent. Uh, and so you see it's used by people who have a vested interest in attacking pretty much everybody. Uh, at one stage, uh, I think back 10-15 years ago, it became very popular to use the word political cult. So if you did a political organization, it became a political cult. And now uh, this controversy is very much alive in Israel. But of course this has nothing to do with social science, uh, yeah. not psychology or criminology. It, it's just uh, a technique. Uh, we can say they use brainwashing, but we don't believe in brainwashing. Yeah, really. Brainwashing, so to speak, the public opinion uh, by the malicious use of the war cult. So that's again is why the war cult, uh, I would say, even criminologists, if they can find another one, it would be better because now the war cult uh, is not uh, something with a, a content, it's a weapon. It's a weapon you use against the groups you don't like. You, you want to send them out of business, you use the war cult. Personally, I feel that not all the journalists are the professionals in this field. That's why I'm asking you, because you are the professor, you are keen on this field. You have a lot of research, scientific research. That's why you could have your own professional opinion. Journalists, unfortunately, usually do not have such research and they do not have any right to say any sort of opinion if they do not know anything about this topic. Two journalists who specialized in uh, religion who have written very good stuff, uh, but uh, they are just a few because, of course, journalists cannot be experts of everything. But what happens? Journalists listen to those who have a more sexy story. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the stories about uh, destructive cults, uh, brainwashing, uh, terrible things uh, happening to innocent people, uh, uh, they make good copy, they sell the media. That's not very sexy for selling newspapers, <laughs> but if you can say destructive cult operates in your city, people will buy the newspaper. Yeah. It's just some tool of making a hot piece of news, right? Yeah, but that's, in a way, it's not avoidable, I mean, it's what it's all about. But I think it's important uh, for the academia, for instance, uh, to uh, try to, to understand how the process works and to interact with uh, journalists and try to explain. And I think 
For instance, in my country, in Italy, we did achieve some results because uh, uh, now it's more common in issues about the so-called cults mm-hmm. that uh, the journalists would also seek the opinion of academics. Not only the opinion of the academics, but at least we are normally interviewed that can give our opinion, somewhat moderating the, the opinion of, uh, of different people with different uh, agendas. Mm-hmm, I see. Thank you so much. Uh, could you please also uh, tell me maybe some facts or your own opinion? Uh, who are those people who hang on the label of a cult over, let me say, some sort of organization? Like, you know, over some sort of company, uh, some sort of group of people. Who are those people who are just throwing the labels upon all of them? Well, in sociology, we call them moral entrepreneurs or moral people. And so these are people who try to use morality to further their own interest, saying we are very moral people and we attack other people as not being moral. So again, it, uh, it comes from different groups. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it comes from the mainline churches. They have a vested interest in keeping uh, Uh, out of their turf, uh, new organizations. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, within uh, uh, the mainline churches, if a new church comes from the United States or even is uh, created locally, they don't like, so they try to protect it. And this is normal, and that can be done in a very intimate way if uh, uh, it's done the fair leads that by criticizing the ideas rather than uh, uh, accusing uh, the new players of crimes they have not committed but otherwise it's normal it's legitimate uh, that the orthodox church in russia say we are the truth uh, and if the protestant comes from us or... uh, one more question please as for the russian orthodoxy and the mechanism of the apologetic centers Uh, your personal mm-hmm. opinion, please. What are these apologetic centers are made for? Who are they trying to protect? Who are they trying to save? Who are they trying to help for some sort of money as well? Well, well again, apologetic is not a bad word in general. Okay. Apologetic only means that uh, every church tries to Uh, explain why they believe their religion is the true religion and that's again is normal everybody does it but if uh, in doing my apologetics i accuse uh, uh, other groups uh, of something which is not true this apologetics is no longer legitimate again i came across a guy i believe it's still active called alexander dvorkin from russia and uh, he's typically Uh, came to international conferences uh, mm-hmm. and uh, launched the accusations against the Mormons, against the Jehovah's Witnesses, against many other groups, and these accusations were simply not true. So, uh, apologetics, again, uh, very legitimate, normal, part uh, of uh, every religion. Mm-hmm. They will say your religion is false, the other ones say no, your religion is false, and that's normal, it's going on from thousands of, of years. Yeah, sure. mm-hmm. To accuse uh, one group, uh, religious, philosophical, uh, of something which is not true, That's not uh, real apologetics, and that becomes the uh, slander, uh, libel, falsehood. And uh, again, there are examples everywhere, but there are examples mm-hmm. in Russia, and I would say the activities of Mr. Dvorkin are yeah. uh, not particularly appreciated with respect. Thank you for your correct and very respectful answer. Could I please ask you of uh, Mr. Alexander Dworkin and his actions? Mm, how could you estimate his actions? Why is he doing all that stuff that we are seeing in the internet? Why is he accusing the people and groups of people who are not even connected with their religions and beliefs and personal beliefs moreover? What do you think about that? I think uh, uh, Mr. Dworkin, uh, in one way, is connected with an international network of anti-cultists. Mm-hmm. So it seems it's uh, 
theories of the international anti-cult movement, he picks it up in an international literature and brings them to Russia. On the other hand, for reasons I do not completely understand, he is taken seriously by parts of the Orthodox Church, while uh, I would say he is not taken seriously internationally, he tried to come to some academic conferences, he was more or less ridiculed uh, because uh, his reconstructions of groups uh, like the Hare Krishna or Jehovah's Witnesses were so far away from uh, academic life, he was not taken, so he stopped coming to academic conferences. But uh, uh, in Russia, for some reason, uh, I see he's taken seriously by parts of the Orthodox Church, which is very strange to me, yeah, because is. some theories are uh, really extreme. Mm -hmm. I have seen something he says, for instance, about the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, it's really strange, it's very far away from the reality. And uh, a quick look uh, at the rich academic literature now existing of the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, will persuade everybody that Mr. Dworkin theories are simply uh, figments of his imagination. Mm -hmm. The only dynamic literature of Jehovah's Witnesses is all in English, and perhaps some people do not read English in Russia, and that may be part of the problem. Maybe it is. But still, he is not an academician, he is not a professor, but due to some reason, his opinion is so overspread and overwhelmed last, let me say, 10 years. And it's a real strange tendency. What do you personally feel about this tendency? Because I guess Mr. Dworkin is not alone in this field. There are a lot of people who are helping him. Why do they do this? Again, I think he, he, he and his friends found the support of portion of the Orthodox Church because uh, portions of the Orthodox Church may believe uh, uh, that Mr. Dworkin is uh, helping them, uh, protecting their tariff from the intrusion of other people's interests. Uh, on the other hand, for the media, uh, of course, for the media, Mr. Dworkin tells very sensational stories. Uh, yeah, this he does. So, mm -hmm. And good copy, and uh, they are more sexy than the, the, the quiet stories told by social scientists. So we are not very sexy because we don't tell lurid tales about young women raped uh, by the Hare Krishna, which is not really not true. It may have happened in one of the cases, but again, it happens in all the religions. So we don't tell lurid tales, uh, but these lurid tales make much better copy than the versions of the, the academics or the social science. Mm -hmm. it's very, in this sense it's very dangerous and I will that in the United States uh, they have recognized how dangerous it is. Uh, the FBI set up to investigate what really happened. And I was consulted and many other academics around the world were consulted. The FBI has decided to completely uh, organization of the American University Prof International, I'm a member of it, uh, uh, the University Professor of Religious Matters, because uh, sometimes if these people, the professional anti-cultists advise the governments, they can even provoke tragedies in Guaco, really? because they give very false uh, uh, information, mm -hmm. and false information may cost uh, human lives. Oh, so thank you so much. Really, I'm just impressed with all you've told and all you explained. And finally, uh, one more question, please. Uh, being a lawyer, being a professional, being a professor, being a socialist, could you please provide us of certain pieces of advice, helping certain people or organizations protect themselves when they're being blamed and being accused, how could these people protect themselves? That's the truth. Uh, open yourself to investigation by academics, including international academics. That normally helps a lot. 
Е, ние в Америка, в университетите, че знаеш, словет академик са едно злоя, да е едно апон, да е откъм до си онли гутикс, ever group, аз проблем са, до без групи на Word, аз проблем са, става да е академик, да е хамбет и без ти гейн, да е муцин гути, да е муцин от проблем са, but at being a candy, the opening web sites to education by scholars. Scholars are not journalists either, so they have other tools, they interview people, how they come at me, and when these scholars, I think, may provide another voice. They have seen it in 30 years of activity in countless times. The groups who are more in trouble are the groups nobody knows in the academia. So there is a narrative about them by the moral entrepreneurs, the anti-cultists, saying these are destructive couples, sex, bad people. And no alternative narrative, while on many other groups, at least there are two different stories. There is the stories by the anti-cultists and the journalists say these are destructive couples, But if they have been studied by academics, perhaps there is an article, perhaps a seminar has been organized, a session in an international conference. And we can say, okay, we have two different evaluations, one evaluation by the anti-cultist and one evaluation by academics. Who will you believe? The academics are more believable than the anti-cultists. Perhaps not by journalists, but at a certain level they are more believed. And even journalists in many countries now take academics and professional scholars more seriously. So my advice is always to be very candid and not to expect that academics would act as lawyers or advocates. So building an objective Uh, authoritative narrative uh, against the, 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 the sensationalist narrative is, is the way to go. And of course this applies to groups who have nothing to hide. Thank you so very much for your kind attention, for all your professional response and answers, for your kind consultation. You're a real professional. Thank you so much. Okay.